Sharon Yannicki is an adjunct assistant professor of faculty of health sciences, but she's also a research, a, a research affiliate of Credit Institute. Uh, registered nurse, uh, she's actively engaged in research and sessional teaching. Since her retirement, she can't be retired. <laughs> uh, as coordinator for public health and Aboriginal health degree programs, in June, she retired in June two, 2017. She has a PhD in nursing, MSc in health promotion, both from the University of Alberta. She's a mixed methods researcher with interest in health equity, cultural safety, moral sensitivity. I could go on and on, so I won't because I wouldn't have any, that many time to speak. Uh, Dr. Vivian Sutor, sorry, Sutor, uh, has a Doctor of Medicine from the University of British Columbia. She practiced family medicine for eight years, both uh, working both in rural and urban hospitals, uh, the most rural being a missionary position in the northwest frontier province of Pakistan. Is that right? Um, after, this is her, not me saying this, after feeling disillusioned by the inability of primary care and emergency medicine to impact upstream health protection and social determinants of health, she pursued a Master's of Public Health in 2006. She's also a consultant with the Alberta Cancer Board, and she is, uh, has been Lead Medical Officer of Health in the South Zone, this one, uh, for Alberta Health Services uh, for the past 10 years, as well as an occupational health consultant and medical lead for Alberta Health Services South Zone Infection Prevention and Control. So these are very elite people, very well skilled, but they also have the good judgment to hire into their project one of our previous postdocs, Dan <laughs> So this indicates even more quality. <laughs> so we welcome you and we thank you, and I'm going to be the Wicked Witch on timing, so we have Excellent. time for um, discussion and questions. Thank you. So thank you for doing this. We're looking forward to it. So I'm just going to speak from here. Um, hope you can all hear me on the right. Um, so if you, if you need me to speak up a little bit more from the back, please uh, let me know. Um, so as well as uh, Dan Dutton, who ha is um, joining us for the costing analysis part of this study, um, we've had James Zakea, um, and he is a, a graduate of our MSc in Health Sciences, and so uh, um, he um, helped us uh, with qualitative analysis on this study, and um, he, is, um, uh, he led one of the focus groups with uh, male Syrian refugees, and he's now working in Calgary on a very similar um, project with Syrian refugees. So very, very uh, cool looking uh, with James. Um, I just wanted to um, note that this, that the time period we're talking about is uh, January to March 2016. Um, that we're looking at the experiences of Syrians who arrived um, during that time period. Uh, just. For Vivian and I, we need to uh, declare um, that we have no conflict of interests. Uh, we received uh, funding uh, from the Parkland Institute at the University of Alberta to support us um, with the study, and that enabled us to uh, fund uh, the cost of um, translator translation of our focus groups and uh, um, our um, interpreters throughout. And there's Vivian's slide as well. Um, some acknowledgments for us to do. Um, we want to thank all of the refugee participants in this study. Um, Lethbridge uh, Family Services, Immigrant Services contribution was uh, very essential in uh, supporting us uh, with providing interpreters and the support of um, uh, the um, the other staff and volunteers, and as well as all of the AHS staff and people who contributed um, to this study. The focus group participants themselves, um, our funder, and flexibility learning systems supported us with recruitment by allowing us to come and directly speak to um, Syrian refugees who were doing ESL classes there. So all of those contributions we, we really um, appreciate, essential to doing this study. 
Um, so what I'm going to talk about and what and Vivian is going to um, do uh, the, kind of the centerpiece of this um, will give you some background on the context of um, the study and, and the Syrian refugee um, immigration to, um, to Lockbridge, the funding, um, policy questions and research questions and the design of the study because this is a mixed method study we have a couple of different areas of focus for the study um, we're going to talk a little bit about the descriptive statistics the background of who came through those refugee clinics in that january uh, to march period in 2016 and uh, then the qualitative findings some just key findings uh, related um, to the experiences of the syrian refugees and um, uh, some components from the, the focus groups with professionals and agency staff. Um, and our study had to go through um, lots of approval processes, as you can see there. Um, we had ethics <coughs> review from the ethics um, um, Health Ethics Review Board at the University of Alberta. Um, we had operational review from Alberta Health Services. And we had uh, community partners who had to provide letters of support. Um, so those um, those stages, um, uh, as you can imagine, working with community partners and getting through um, multiple stages of approval takes a little time. Um, the the purpose of our study um, is really to um, uh, look at the experiences and satisfaction. Um, of the participants um, in the um, in health services um, in the interactions and um, the feelings of safety as you participate in um, a new uh, refugee health clinic model <coughs> and we wanted to know the experiences of the health professionals that were um, going through that experience as well for the first time in a multidisciplinary setting and then we're trying to evaluate um, effectiveness but really it's the costing that we can do because we don't have all of the elements of effectiveness for this particular study but we're looking at comparing this novel model um, that was designed um, here in South Sound um, to standard care. So just to get a bit of the conceptual background of what we're talking about so that um, those terms that we're using um, make sense. Um, when we're talking about cultural safety, we're thinking about it um, as an experience of feeling safe from the context of the person receiving services. And so that's kind of a little bit back, backwards of, of the way in which we might have thought about being sensitive. We're thinking about how are we doing? Um, but this is kind of the flip side and thinking about how is it being experienced and what do we need to do to balance the power relationships between people in, the, in that um, context. So that's um, an important way of evaluating it. Um, and it's, this concept comes to us from New Zealand and has become um, kind of, uh, kind of a, a very... Um, a well-established concept in, in Canadian literature as well. So it's um, it's also um, focusing on uh, the empowerment process and people feeling able to speak about their experiences um, and that checking with them actually. So what we're doing in in the study by by having checked about their experience is part of that honoring the, the focus on their experience in terms of cultural safety. Uh, Trauma-informed care um, is a, another concept that's come into the literature in understanding and recognizing the trauma experiences from the past and the present in, impact our current um, health and our future health and that we need to um, not, we have to have processes for dealing with trauma but you don't openly just ask people to talk about their experiences because you could be triggering trauma experiences then in that setting. And so there, there's a process of 
um, recognizing the trauma and being able to refer if people bring it up, but not being the one to, to be triggering that. Um, so this is a very different way of um, looking at that process in the in refugee clinics and um, recognizing that the, this particular group had come from um, experiences of war and, and a variety of types of trauma. So um, that was an integral part. Um, and part of uh, the process was that we had to go through training and to do this study. So um, James and I did an online course um, and uh, there were many online materials and training materials that staff went through and so that's all part of preparation for understanding the experiences. Health equity, um, another um, concept that um, very familiar to many of you I'm sure um, but when we're talking about equity, we're talking about fairness and not just equal shares kind of idea. So it, in equity, we're thinking about the needs-driven approach um, that, um, that people need um, services based on their needs, um, but also that um, the fairness in terms of how we um, respect and recognize them uh, for their cultural identity. Those, in, in providing those services. Um, and so in our case, we're looking at um, the context of a public policy decision by the federal government to um, have a rapid settlement process. So this was a new way of doing business. Uh, it meant lots of refugees came um, more speedily to Lethbridge and sometimes arrived sick. And so all of that context affected the design of um, how the services were going to be delivered. Uh, we're looking at then um, the model that was used to address those early days and the context that you're getting a rapid, a large group rapidly resettled with no extra funding for health services. So then you have to innovate in order in how you deliver those health services so you can still provide equity. Mm -hmm. Does this work here? It is not hooked up. All right, now before I start, I think it was a good segue. I, I know the introductions were done, but I really would like to acknowledge everybody who was involved. There is a, we have this issue coming, right? We've got 25,000 uh, uh, refugees to come to Canada in a very, very short time order. And about, usually about 11% uh, or so come to Alberta. Southern Alberta has three of the six resettlement centers for refugees in Alberta, Brooks Medicine and Lethbridge. So how, and Lethbridge is the largest center there. So how do we prepare for this, not only respond to when they arrive, but how do we make this successful? So it was a massive undertaking even before people arrived. If we plan, planning for measles, planning for a pandemic, planning for whatever, then the response becomes fun and, easy, and not easy, but um, people are engaged and it, becomes, it does become a fun process. I really need to thank, and there's a number of staff here uh, from Alberta Health Services who saw that combined vision. We had a vision, how can we? What have we been doing for refugees? How can we improve this? And this wasn't just my idea, it was a collaborative idea and our zone leadership and, and senior leadership in Alberta Health Services supported that. So a vision that we all had together. And after every clinic, we tweaked some things because we didn't realize people were coming in so ill that we had to send them to their doctors or to emergency or wherever. People, and, and so the basic needs of that, so suddenly we had to bring a doctor on board. I mean, I was doing that part of work, but it was not reasonable for us with all these you know, already uh, tasks that we had. So it really was a joint vision, and everybody was involved in that. Lethbridge Family Services are amazing a number of uh, translators um, that were speaking Arabic that we had there, and they were consistent, and other people. It really was in the city as well. It was a great uh, unified collaborative response. So I just really want to acknowledge that I'm just humbly here speaking on behalf of everybody else because this was really a, a, a big joint effort. Um, <clears throat> so again, within refugees, there's different types of... Uh, classes when people come into Canada. This specifically was around refugee status and then primarily uh, individuals that came during that, the time period that we're studying were government assisted refugees and private sponsors. So government assisted they get sort of 
um, federal funding for housing, et cetera, for the first year. Private sponsors, a lot of the housing, et cetera, has to be uh, provided by the private sponsor. They all benefit, though, from services, healthcare, education, um, services provided by Lethbridge Family Services, for example, uh, for all those individuals. We didn't get any blended visa at the time. <clears throat> it's a different category. So <clears throat> the government changed, the federal government changed a bit. They were going to have 25,000 people coming in by the end of December. <clears throat> and then that changed, and not many people maybe picked up on that in the media, but um, it was actually they were going to they change it because it was way too rapid. Um, and they needed to have a consistent screening approach like they would in any kind of refugee camp. And so medical exams, et cetera, and other screening. And so it slowed down a little bit to be comprehensive. And so they identified the refugees to come to Canada by end of December, and by end of February they were here. <clears throat> so uh, interestingly enough, we didn't know when people would be coming. So Lethbridge Family Services would get a call in the afternoon saying, you know, there's three families of 11 each coming. Then you need hotel rooms, you need food, you need diapers, whatever, right? So it was a very rapid response and it, <coughs> excuse me, and the city, the mayor were at the airport, like it really, again, was this collaborative response. Oh, I need to use this thing here. All right, <coughs> just a comment on this slide, I'm not gonna belabor it, but it was a federal response. We used emergency disaster management principles in planning and in the response phase. So in planning, we started planning in early October, end of September. How are we going to manage this from a public health perspective? And then what about the city? So <clears throat> there was a, a, within Alberta Health Services, actually in South Zone, Alberta Health Services, we opened our emergency operating center. Why not deal this the same as a flood or a fire? Because it's quick, it's, it's, it's co uh, clear communication, clear roles and responsibilities. We're working with lots of external agencies, etc. And that system works. We practice it all the time. And I think all the nurses here and others, uh, they're used to the language and the city, etc. So we, it was a sort of a cascaded uh, information. So we are get information from federal minister all the way down within the same, like within an hour, all the way down to even my office. And then we would continue planning. <clears throat> oh, I'm so used to using that. Okay, so I've talked about this piece here. Now the unusual setting is that Lethbridge in the previous years had about 70 <coughs> to 100 refugees a year. And they would be dispersed throughout the year. Now we're talking suddenly we're going to have 200 or more refugees in a month or two. So that's a sudden significant influx for all the partners, for everybody. For housing, for schools, for health, right? For everybody. <clears throat> and how can we make that successful? Some of the common barriers that are frequently experienced, and it's interesting, many of them came out, that were still some challenges um, in the focus group. Um, and so again, every time we tweaked a little bit, the focus group had people from the first clinic all the way to the last clinic that we studied. So healthcare cards, it, even though they have federal interim federal health funding, when you come to emergency department and don't have a card and you're not in a system, you're not denied access, but it becomes complicated. And then you've got a family of 11, they each have something, well, the emergency department can't deal very well with that. It's not that they, right, it becomes complicated. Then you have to go to the lab, well, the lab, you don't have a card. Then you have to go somewhere else, and this card is your ticket. We hear about people, you know, living rough or so who don't have identity cards. It's very, very challenging. So the Alberta healthcare cards, when you have such an influx, it's great to get them, but it's not just pushing a button. It has to go to, and there was kind of, there were, um, challenges all the way up the line to get them done. Suddenly Alberta Health has to issue many, many cards across province, right? So there was a, uh, some challenges with the Alberta healthcare cards. Over time, we sorted that out so that hopefully when people came, within 48 hours, they had a card. But initially that was a challenge because of the rapid influx. <coughs> language barriers, if you, right? So again, language barriers, the thing that's been addressed, all our family doctors here in the Chinook PCN in the west side, they all have access to language line now. So that if you have a client in your office, you can dial a language line who are certified uh, translators on the phone and they will break call in. So if you come to your family doctor, you can actually converse. A little bit challenging when you have mental health concerns or so, when you're talking to a phone and you don't know who's at the other end. Sometimes there's gender challenges or whatever, but um, language barriers are significant, even just cultural barriers. Um, many individuals who came here from the Syrian refugees were, were sort of, uh, quite poor, in the, that we got here in Lethbridge, quite poor and were illiterate in their own language as well. And it's different than what was sort of uh, um, explained or the, the um, sort of the demographics that we received from the federal government it was quite different. Um, 
Uh, the other thing, for example, some barriers, if we have our public health offices, sometimes we have a little office. How do you fit a family of 11 in there with eight children running around in that little place and you've got to give six needles to every child? How on earth do you do that logistically? It's very challenging with one nurse in there. So there's some other barriers there. The other thing is, typically if a family comes in and there's time, there's not 10 families coming, then Lethbridge Family Services make sure there's a family physician, they meet and greet the family dogs, and they take the family to the lab, and then another day they go to public health, and then they may go to oral health, we have representatives from oral public health here, then they may have to go to the dentist, so there's lots and lots of trips. Then somebody's pregnant, they need a different appointment, they get to go to a prenatal visit, so it is a lot of time that Lethbridge Family Services and a translator, that they drive families, or sometimes two vans of families, right, to go to a different appointment, and to all these appointments. And that is a barrier to access, because they have to, and then they're not learning language or understanding policing, they're not understanding lots of things that, that we in, in Canada um, need to know. Sometimes the interim federal health funding is challenging because they don't have, I mean, there's funding there for oral health, and oral health is one that really stands out here. Um, there's minimal funding for like uh, caries or pulling a tooth. They're not going to put a crown on or something. Okay, so it, it's mineral funding, including for psychology and other, other things. Okay, so then we decided, okay, this is again in our planning phase, really kind of trying to be creative and innovative. How are we going to provide healthcare service, acute and preventive healthcare services? So we worked with Lethbridge Family Services and we developed this model, and we called it the multidisciplinary refugee clinics. In southern Alberta, there, other than Calgary or Edmonton, there is no refugee health center. So in Toronto, Vancouver, Calgary, they have a place of refugees for the first two years of arrival. They're there, they have family doctors who deal with more refugees and sort of challenges there. They have the social support, psychological supports, et cetera. We don't have that. And we actually agreed with all primary care and with our nursing staff and Alberta Health Services that we don't need it. Everybody, this is a changing world. It's a changing demographics. We all need to be comfortable as physicians and myself as a family doc and in public health with newcomers. If they're coming from sub-Saharan Africa, they may need to be screened for different things. If they're coming from Syria, there's little TB there, right? So different countries have different uh, public health risks or challenges or health challenges that individuals have. And also different, uh, as, as Sharon said, different backgrounds or trauma or whatever else may have happened in that situation in, in, their, in their past. We also developed a process, the importance of primary care, to be attached to a primary care clinic. So we worked with the family physician so that the idea was that within 48 hours, so healthcare card and then, and it was often happening, happening simultaneously, there would be an assigned family physician. So we had over 25 family physicians who, who wanted Syrian refugees, even though their clinics were closed and full. Everybody wanted to help and, and said, sure, we'll get, I'll take some families. And that process continues. So we worked with the uh, primary care no networks and pediatricians as well. We provided cultural safety training and trauma-informed care. So all the staff here were doing that. We've all done that. Even for the family physicians, I did education for them as well and gave them also other tools that they could utilize themselves within their clinics. Very important to be prepared beforehand. So this is the statistics um, over this time period. So uh, the first group arrived in December. The clinic that we, that we had was January 21st. So, but they were arrivals from December. So we had 190 refugees, which again, usually we get 70 or so a year prior to this time. This is a lot in a very short time frame, in two months basically. 186 were from Syria and there was one family from Nepal. These are the Bhutanese refugees where we have the highest density in Canada here in Lethbridge. Um, there were 161 government-assisted refugees and 29 um, private sponsors, and those were primarily through the churches. Um, and these were 39 families. Now, there are about four or five individual people. So if there's a family of 11, the grandma comes, they're treated as a separate individual, but they're actually attached to the whole family, so it's a family of 12, but it's counted there as separate. And the age range, as you can see, it's a very young population. There was one 60-year-old, 60 68-year-old, I should say. The rest are very young. <coughs> And there are very few single males or so. They were primarily families that were uh, coming. Um, so the average age was 19. The age range, again, was under 1 uh, to 68. And 60% were children. But this impacts what we do. 
impacts our health care. So all health care, all our Alberta health services knew about this so that we make sure that we have capacity and, and um, uh, understanding of uh, new newcomers coming in. Um, so the multidisciplinary clinics, I'll just give you a, a quick, what did we provide at these clinics? So the public health uh, nurse clinic lead, so Tanil, who's sitting across from me right there, she was the lead for most clinics. I know Tammy, you were lead at one of the clinics or two of the clinics. Um, and so this is a big ordeal. You have to make sure everything's working um, very well. You're sort of the, the, the conductor of the orchestra there. Um, and there's many moving parts. We had many nurses there, and there are uh, public health nurses here, and administrative support. They have to enter all the immunization records. And so ideally we had the records early and we translated them prior. That wasn't always the situation. We had oral public health. We did quite a thorough oral public health, so that was for screening. And we had a dental hygienist and one of our dental assistants is here um, who was involved in all of those clinics. Um, we provided uh, fluoride varnish as well for children under 19, which is not something we usually do for newcomers. So this was actually exceptional service. Uh, so what we, we added things compared to what we usually do. We registered individuals who were pregnant or just had had a baby because there's uh, different programs available, but there's also food coupons available, etc., for these individuals. Um, and then there's more support, so they're uh, t tapped into that uh, those options right away. Um, we had some health promotion, tobacco. Tobacco is a standard thing in men. Men decompress around the smoke. But it's expensive here. It's the first thing they realize. So expensive. So we had information around Quick Core, which is a evidence-based uh, a, a strategy to uh, encourage individuals to quit uh, smoking and, and provide ongoing support. They also received nicotine replacement, $750 of nicotine replacement therapy uh, if they registered, etc. cetera. Um, we had uh, chronic disease uh, management. We had a nurse there who would give general information around chronic diseases because many individuals did come in with chronic diseases. Again, we waited for some of the screening blood glucose being it say that has to go to the family dog right they need to have that tie but just basic to, to uh, basically give information mental health the evidence said do not screen people who come from trauma right away your first visit for trauma right we can't go and start being psychiatrists or psychologists right then and there because we don't how do you deal with that when people start um, <clears throat> dissociating and, 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 and going back into sort of their, uh, their, 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 their trauma mentally and physically um, but the purpose there was if there was any urgent referral, sometimes there was children who were acting really, really strange. And the, the mental health uh, professional would say, you know, would you like your child? And so we could refer some of these kids immediately. Some people actually came forward saying, you know what, I have bullet wounds here because I've been sleeping in front of the cave all, for, for all these, this time and my family was in there and I've got bullet wounds here and I need some help. So some people actually came forward with it. Um, the second one, let them know there's a crisis line here. If you get you know, challenging thoughts in your head, call this line. Um, and then also that mental health in, in Canada is holistic, holistic, part of our holistic health. It's not something to be ashamed of. Mental health here is, is part of our biopsychosocial model. Um, in the first, we didn't have a family physician in the first clinic, but we had a lot of people sick. So I kept running back and forth to assess these kids, and Sunil kept calling, Vivian, we need you over here. Um, we had a lab tech. So people, they need screening when they come to Canada. They have syphilis and HIV and TB screening. That could be a, a year prior. So we repeat that because they could have easily picked up these diseases in, in a refugee settings, <coughs> camps. Um, so they didn't have to go travel to the lab with their family of 11. So we worked with the family physicians to look at and the evidence-based guidelines from Canada on, on what to screen and, and how we transfer that information to the family physicians. So again, it was a one-stop shop. This was the second, the last the bullet there, volunteers. We had AHS volunteers who had gone through uh, police checks, et cetera. They were there to entertain the kids so that the parents could listen to the psychologist. They could listen to this tobacco cessation person. The kids were, you know, hands and feet that didn't speak Arabic, the, our volunteers, uh, with the children. And some of them were our my, like the public health students we had. Um, but they were coloring with the kids and playing games. And they were having a good time. So the kids were being entertained after their shots, after their oral health. And that was really, really amazing because it allowed the parents to focus and we still had oversight of the kids. Now, the, the, the room was a bit small, so there were lots of kids, it was very busy, but um, I think it, that was a really uh, beneficial program. I'm very biased, but we'll hear that from. <laughs> you could just see it working, you could hear it from Sharon. And then we had Arabic interpreters. There were consistent, lovely individuals who came every single time to help mm -hmm. and interpret. 
And oftentimes we had a navigator with the family, because some of these families are large, so that they could interpret as well. And a navigator also from Lethbridge Family Services um, and or the translator. So that worked really, really well. Because um, people were in the clinic about two hours, depending on the time, three hours. Sometimes it was a little bit shorter, depending on the family size. So this is some of the statistics for the three clinics. The first clinic, we had 52 individuals, and we uh, staggered them. Um, and that was 10 families, and they all arrived on the December 21st. So, and then you can see the numbers there. I'm not going to uh, read this slide out, but you can see that hopefully within two weeks of arrival, in general, we had individuals in this clinic. Sometimes it was quicker, sometimes they arrived on the 11th and they were in on the 18th. They had to settle, they had to sleep, they had to eat. That was the first request because people hadn't slept for days and days and they'd been traveling and stuck at airports with weather conditions, etc. And some came without even diapers. So they really need to have extreme bare basics first and then we could get them into these clinics. Um, so interesting when we look at records, so this is more again looking at the work here. So. There was only two kids who had, and they were one-year-olds, who just had their shots over at the refugee camp. Um, basically, very few people came with their complete records. That makes a lot more work, and it creates that we have to give a lot more immunizations. Um, so kids received anywhere from two to six vaccine depending, vaccines, depending on age, and adults generally two. Again, I'm generalizing, but it, it is how we look at what the workload is for, uh, for uh, nursing staff. After four weeks, you can have a booster dose for most of these vaccines. So we had a secondary clinic, we call this a primary clinic, we had a secondary clinic so that at the month, the clinic when you go back, that came a month later, so we had a clinic every two weeks. The afternoon would be a secondary clinic, so people who came to this clinic would then come back to that clinic in their second, get their booster doses, including the children. The children may have to get further doses at school, but the adults would then basically be completed with their immunization, most of the time, not always, but in general. So we had the primary and then we had the secondary. Um, <clears throat> and there was only eight clients who did not receive any immunizations. So basically all those individuals, that's, I mean, again, get all those individuals in your own office at, over in our public health office and schedule them there. So this is, uh, this lady here is uh, uh, Tanzania, right? Yes. Doing missionary work there now. But um, so she was our dental hygienist and she was uh, screening everybody. Everybody was screened and basically for two things, one for urgent and urgent meant verbal pain. I have pain here. Second, abscess. Um, if there's visible as abscess or severely broken tooth, I think there was one with oral cancer. That was also an urgent. Um, caries. And that basically was extensive carry. It wasn't just a little tiny one molar with a decay. This was extensive caries. Um, and again, all kids except two had fluoride varnish. And any, everybody under 19. So this is actually really amazing and, and a shocking statistics, and we know that uh, access to dentists is different. It's a more private system, et cetera, and this really here speaks to that. So if you can see that, in general, the oral health was very, very poor. And you can look at the children under five. I mean, there's kids one year old with urgent needs. There's the five to 10 group, 65% had pain or abscess. And 83 had four or more carries. I mean, this is shocking. Um, you can see the 11 to 18 group, but a little bit different. They also have, I mean, adult teeth are a little bit stronger. And then they're over 18. When I speak to the oral health uh, dental assistant there, she said many of them had bridges and crowns and things in their teeth. So, so from previous, before the previous four years, before Civil War. So oral health, we always forget in the public health system the importance of oral health. And it is really important. We had people like really, really ill with some of this, and people can get like extremely sick from poor dental hygiene. <clears throat> Oops. Um, so the other thing that we provided was pre and postnatal. We talked about that. People who reported pregnancy, I think by the end of the year, everybody got, was pregnant, <laughs> I think almost all families, right? Uh, but they reported, it, and then they had that relationship, and then they, <coughs> through, I, I, even in the secondary multidisciplinary clinic, when they came the second time, more people registered. Tobacco cessation initially was a little bit hesitant, and then when word of mouth came around, and in the secondary clinics, more individuals registered because it was expensive. And we've actually created a Arabic quick court program, so just the Arabic men would come. It was mainly men, I think, because um, the women don't really smoke. Um, and they, we provided that quick court program in Arabic. 
primary care. We provided at three clinics because people were coming in quite sick. It was also the peak of influenza and norovirus, gastrointestinal illness season. When do people get most ill? January, February is when people were coming in, and December. Um, and that was different across the province. Some people, like in Medicine Hat, people weren't coming in that ill. So it, it varied a little bit. Uh, we had quite a, just in those three clinics, we had quite a few referrals that were directly sent to their family doctor within that day or the next day. Because they had a family doc, they didn't have to go to merge. Before everybody was scooted to emergency because there was no doctor attached. So, and then they start developing that relationship with their primary care office. Mental health, all clients got provided information around what is mental health, as we talked about. There was a couple children flagged and referred. Others who shared concerns, but they wanted to wait. They said, you know, I know I need to deal with this, right? I know I've had wounds in my, in my shoulder, I need to wait. Um, because they had to deal with their basic needs first. Um, again, we talked about the one month later, we had uh, secondary clinics. And I'm gonna pass it over to Sharon. So I'm just going to back up a little bit and talk about the study design and how we uh, then proceeded to uh, um, go forward with, with um, recruiting uh, some of the refugees to participate in talking circles. So the design in mixed methods, you're doing a qualitative study where you're trying to understand people's experiences. And we're also doing a quantitative study because we want to understand what was the cost of doing it this kind of a model and how did it differ from what was previously offered. So in terms of the focus groups, we had um, focus groups with Syrian refugees. We had 10 um, male um, Syrian refugees and 10 female. Um, one uh, one um, participant withdrew, um, so 19 um, stayed through the whole talking circle, but we did have some information from 20. Um, and in the focus groups with um, Alberta Health Services, we had 21 participants, lots of interest in participating and lots of information um, commenting on, on um, opportunities for improvement and their experiences. The um, Lethbridge Family Services um, immigrant services. We had settlement workers and Arabic interpreters um, and uh, seven participants in that group. And so these were conducted in uh, 2017. And our quantitative study is um, still in progress and we're just um, getting access to some of the data we need. Um, so the talking circles um, with Syrian refugees, uh, recruitment was a bit of a, a challenge because we were, um, we were not allowed to recruit directly by any service provider. And so that meant that as the, the research team, um, James and I had to go and talk directly to groups of refugees. Um, so we had the support of immigrant services to do that and uh, flexibility learning. Um, literacy levels were an issue. We're, we're speaking to refugees one year after arrival, and so they, they've got some English, but um, their literacy levels, uh, for many of them, were still very low. Uh, so our, our uh, mat recruitment materials had to be scaled down as simply as possible. We needed to divide talking circles into um, gender-specific groups to uh, respect their cultural practices and um, to make them feel comfortable. And so um, James uh, worked with a, a male um, in interpreter and I worked with a female interpreter for the two groups that we held. Health literacy issues um, were coming up in terms of when you have low literacy, you often have difficulty understanding how some of the health concepts and information you're being uh, given and so that that came up in some of um, the uh, interpretation of information issues that we, we saw in the focus groups. And there are certainly some significant differences in the healthcare systems between Syria and Canada, and that also caused some confusion for the refugees um, in understanding how they should go about um, following up on something. So here's the statistics, just um, giving you a, an idea that um, what um, that we had representation from focus groups um, that um, and primary in the focus groups we had representation from all of the clinics that were offered so clinics that were offered in January, February and March and 
you know, people were telling us that they had, you know, around um, two weeks after arrival to one month uh, for a few of them um, till they came to the refugee um, health clinic, the multidisciplinary clinic. So we're looking here just to focus on our study question on cultural safety interactions that they had at the clinic. Um, health equity in terms of access to urgent primary care and preventive health services and their satisfaction. And then we've got themes that we're going to talk about. So um, here I'm going to talk about culturally appropriate and safe services and communication issues which are main you know themes under the cultural safety. Um, and these are again from refugee perspectives um, and the image that you're seeing here is um, a, a picture um, um, that is all in Arabic, with, you know, the text is all in Arabic, so uh, to an example of trying to communicate with the refugees in uh, something that would be comfortable in um, their primary language. But again, not all of them were able to read Arabic. Um, so these are the themes that I'm going to talk about, but I think I'll have to um, skip a few things here as I go forward. Um, so in terms of feeling safe enough to disclose that so that's a, a key issue in in terms of cultural safety and, and your comfort you're being you're able to trust people and act actively you know disclose and, and trust them and so we have here um, three uh, responses from uh, women and they were um, talking about feeling quite able to to trust the the people, the healthcare providers uh, that they were talking to at the refugee health clinics. And um, one comment that, yes, we get it, you know, we have to be able to tell a doctor or, or you know, a nurse what, what, what they need to know about our health issues or we won't get, you know, we won't get treated right. <laughs> yeah, they need to know the details. So they get that part. Uh, choice was an important issue um, in terms of their respecting their choice in terms of privacy issues and the structure of the clinic and so they felt respected and sometimes they they requested a female doctor and if that was possible that was accommodated it wasn't always possible I'm sure um, and for women's issues they often wanted to talk about those in behind closed doors so that was something that for example, better beginnings uh, would take people um, to talk about pregnancy in the in the separate room, and so all of those things. You have a very busy clinic, but you're trying to coordinate the female interpreter to come with the, f the pregnant mom while the dad's doing something else with the kids. It, it's um, it's challenging, and you know um, my uh, my admiration for all the things that were going on here. The uh, dignity, respect, and privacy issues, again, very strong response that they felt respected um, and that, um, that they um, were treated nicely, they said, and um, they recognized that privacy was going to be respected and that, that it wouldn't be shared with other people. Um, they corrected me once uh, and said, no, no, they, the doctor, one doctor would talk to another doctor, yeah. That's right. They had those parts, on, they were understanding those things very clearly. Communication, language, and interpretive services. Um, so we had a little bit of variation here in the response about interpretive services. Um, most people said all the ter interpreters were great, they were nice, um, they were giving the right message. There was a few people though who may have spoken different dialects, we're not sure, but they had some trouble understanding or feeling that they were being correctly represented. So just a, a couple of um, comments uh, about that. And so that led to them perhaps sometimes misunderstanding something at the clinic. Um, in terms of information, um, uh, there was um, generally uh, the majority said that they had enough information at each service. And so that's a, an important thing because you've, you've got so many different types of services at the refugee health clinics, but, and they're able to have a sense uh, that they're, they're getting what they need. Um, another 
uh, participant clarified that we could ask questions, all our questions were answered, that's really important. Um, but one male participant um, <coughs> said that they didn't get enough information before they arrived at the clinic. And this could be related to how soon they arrived and when, in, you know, when the clinic was that they attended, you know, a really short time, not sure. But they were a little confused about the whole process. They just didn't quite know what they were coming to. Um, informed consent, um, again, a, a very big key issue for, for health professionals. In, um, and so for the majority, they, they said they understood um, the vaccines that they were being offered. Um, they were provided a list, so they had some documentation they were taking away with them. Um, they, most of them understood that their record was going to be transferred to their family doctor. Um, one participant said, I got vaccinated, had no idea what the vaccine was for, understood that it was going to be good for me. I just, you know, basically just took it because they told me it was, I should. <laughs> but don't, don't ask me what it was. You know? <laughs> and, they, and they also couldn't read the material that they were given. So they couldn't read Arabic because <laughs> they were given the handouts in Arabic. So uh, for people who had no literacy, this was a much harder harder thing to, to uh, uh, address um, mis misunderstandings or they just they were just willing to come and and trust you um, there was mis one misunderstanding about dental services someone who, who arrived in pain um, thought they were seeing a dentist um, as opposed to a dental hygienist um, expected that they might get some service because someone was looking at their teeth um, and um, came away feeling um, they didn't give me anything for pain and, and they didn't do anything, they just looked at me. So this is an, uh, they also didn't have an understanding of what screening was. Um, so um, there, there's bound to be some uh, misunderstandings as you go through such differences in terms of healthcare systems and expectations. Um, in terms of uh, health equity, these are the key themes that came up, and um, we're, we're going to try and touch on all of these. In, in the picture, you're seeing a display of some of the health promotion materials for, with Arabic translation that was available. In health equity, timeliness was a big issue that we were looking at, and I've already spoken to that timing as, as Vivian. Um, if you were sick on arrival and you happened to be close to a clinic, um, then that was pretty perfect for you, might, if, especially if there was a doctor at the clinic and you could get treated right away. And so for some people, that was just like, um, they, they couldn't believe their good fortune in being able to be treated so quickly. Uh, for others, that was a problem that they um, had if they were sick in the hotel and they didn't quite get how to, to call for emergency services or even how one said didn't know how to go to the hospital. Um, so some of them said they suffered a lot during that first two week period um, when they were in the hotel and they were in pain or they were sick for other reasons. Um, one talked about going, she was sick and her daughter was sick and they waited and emerged for a long time and she said that was a difficult experience. Um, and waiting for the Alberta Health Card. Um, health concerns, the limited dental um, services for adults, um, is a, adult health care is a big issue and uh, for men because of the volume of the number of people experiencing pain and needing treatment this was um, getting to a dentist was a big issue but then when they got to the dentist and found out they were just going to get their teeth pulled because that's all the coverage that was provided that was very difficult um, if you have if you were a, um, a family that had private sponsorship sometimes they were able to help them pay for those services and they were able to get their teeth fixed. So you can imagine there was some um, heated discussion on this in the men's discussion group in, as they were talking about having rather different experiences with um, dental care. Um, multidisciplinary services, they thought it was a really good idea to be able to see all in one and they had their kids and they had a full checkup. It was very well organized. 
they were very satisfied with the experiences and the services um, and they had um, lots of positive comments. Referrals. Um, again, some uh, differences in experience. So um, one individual is talking about by the time I got to the dentist that I was referred to, all my records were there. It was great. Um, another person's talking about um, having had blood tests because HIV check screening was done and they didn't know what the result was and they were worried about that. Um, and, but they didn't know how to find out. And so um, that, that caused a lot of anxiety for a few people. Um, but other people had got the instruction that they would only be called, they would be called if there was anything <coughs> wrong, and they weren't worried. So there is varied, you know, in instruction and maybe it's interpretation issues as some of them said. Um, varying healthcare systems, it's different back home and how you get medication, um, and that certainly caused some stress. Opportunities for improvement from their perspective. Um, the follow-up was the main issue uh, for a number of them, and uh, one of them said, it would be perfect if you just, uh, you know, added that one piece. So overall, very positive responses from the refugees. Um, I'm only going to have a few highlights um, that I can give you um, related to um, the, the responses from service providers. Um, here's the kind of range of people that participated and so um, across the three focus groups we covered a, a very a, a broad range of services which was great that everyone was willing to participate. Um, there's lots of themes here and I'm basically going to only probably get to talk about what worked well and what could be improved. Oh, maybe I'll do a few moments that stand out. Um, so, um, you can imagine that um, staff working with people who had experienced trauma were also um, experiencing some distress or that some things really stayed with them. And so this example of a little boy um, who had experienced trauma and he was very distressed, he was having dreams of being shot at. And um, the professional that that was disclosed to wasn't a mental health professional, but they were very grateful to be able to have mental health professionals there that they could uh, engage them and, and help them um, um, help the family to, to get referred to the services they needed. Uh, another uh, moment that uh, that was uh, that really stayed with one of the professionals was at a secondary clinic and it's one month later after the refugee health clinic and uh, a dad is very proudly explaining that his daughters he's taught them how to laugh and to smile and that's the first time so, yeah, that, that touches me too. <laughs> Imagining a child that's three or four years old and has not um, learned to do that. Cultural safety. Um, I think um, I'll just acknowledge that this was a new focus and uh, they were able to make uh, quite a few ad adaptations uh, to accommodate um, some different preferences. There's one issue about consent um, that um, there was some differences of opinion in terms of understanding um, the level of consent that that we needed and I heard from interpreters that it sometimes takes around a year before some refugees get the idea of informed consent um, because they think well, am I going to get services or not? If I consent, if I want the service, I've got to consent. I'm just going to consent. But it takes them a while to feel that they have the power to evaluate that themselves. Um, so um, there is certainly um, one instance in which um, uh, consent was an, um, less than clear for one person. Challenges. Um, We've already talked about most of these. Um, access to more female interpreters just to manage the flow was part of it. 
Um, here's uh, what worked well, and there was um, many, many comments about these things, that refugees felt welcomed, oriented, and comfortable in part because of the group process at the beginning, introducing them, having, a, having someone to um, navigate with them through this maze of uh, different services. Um, the Arabic interpreters, male and female, particularly important linkages to other health services beyond this, um, the initial clinic, um, interconnectedness between the services, the clinic tool that allowed referrals to be sent to um, physicians and dentists for referrals. There's a lot of um, important things here, um, including administrative support, um, food and drinks being available. And um, some opportunities for improvement uh, that um, it's interesting that some of the ongoing, um, uh, the, some of the things that were identified as working well are not in the ongoing clinics that are, are done now. Uh, some of the opportunities for improvement have probably already been addressed. Um, and so this kind of um, talking about it, there's many things that have already um, changed from this. More private, private rooms, uh, the clinic flow, more staffing to match the volume because the first clinic was rather um, understaffed and uh, a little overwhelming. So debriefing after um, a group session was really important for those early experiences um, and anyone who um, talked to someone who had experienced trauma. And so I'm just going to skip to our last conclusion um, slides. Um, so overall, uh, Syrian refugee participants reported feeling respected for cultural and religious customs, and they, um, they had access to um, refugee clinics within um, this, um, an, you know, an acceptable period from their perspective. Uh, Collaboration with primary care networks and having physicians attend the early clinics was helpful in accessing urgent primary care and, and early assessment of refugee, um, early assignment to family docs and that, that linkage hadn't been happening that way before. So that was a, a new thing. Um, based on the qualitative findings, the timely access um, to a wide range of services was really valued in this model and uh, the staff um, provided support for the idea of this model um, but uh, obviously had ideas for opportunities for improvement. Um, the principles of emergency disaster management help to accommodate surge capacity and this really warrants um, further study and maybe applications in other settings because if you've got a model that can scale up to address rapid changes. That's really important in public health and for um, access to uh, preventive services. Um, planning, as Vivian had said, was um, certainly an important thing. Providing training to staff was really helpful, um, although they talked about revising their expectations and really uh, being uh, appreciative of how, um, how much the, the Syrian uh, population appreciated the the um, the services that were being offered, and that it was more flexible than they had kind of expected in in some of the cultural issues. Um, the model offered a range of preventive health services that hadn't been offered before to new coming refugees. So, and the interdisciplinary collaboration was essential. So that's our conclusions. Thanks. There's references at the end for anyone who'd like it.